Hello, everyone. My name is Dakota Russell. I am the executive director of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. And it is my great pleasure today to be here to kick off a series of online programs that we'll be running over the next several weeks. As many of you have no doubt heard, Heart Mountain Interpretive Center has closed its door due to concerns about the COVID-19 virus. But we still wanted to do something to bring a little bit of what we do every day at the center uh, to our larger audience out there online. And so in addition to this program today, you're going to see several programs in the coming days uh, that will highlight a little bit of who we are and what we're about. And so I hope you will continue to stay tuned in. To get us started, I wanted to talk today about a subject that's always interesting to me, uh, which is the story of kids at Heart Mountain. Since we're talking this week about what daily life was like for those incarcerated at Heart Mountain, and since kids make up a significant chunk of the population, I thought we'd start there. Most people don't realize that the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II disproportionately affected kids. In fact, over half of the people incarcerated were minors under the age of 18. And so it's important that we look at their experiences because when we do that, we're really getting the typical camp experience. It typically was something that children experienced. And so I want to get that started today with uh, the story of kids behind barbed wire. Before we jump in, I want to encourage you, if you have questions, to go ahead and type them down in the comments. After the program ends, I will head down there myself and attempt to answer as many questions as I can. So I want to get started by talking a little bit about who these kids were. Uh, for the most part, the kids who wind up at Heart Mountain come from the Los Angeles area. That's where most of Heart Mountain's population is going to come from. But you did also have children who had grown up on farms in rural California and in Washington as well that wound up here. Most of the children were Nisei. Uh, that means that their parents had immigrated from Japan, but they were born here in the United States. And because of that, they had birthright citizenship. They were fully American citizens. And their parents very much encouraged them to take advantage of that citizenship, uh, to assimilate, to do well in school, to learn English, and to become fully American. For the most part, uh, they went to integrated schools uh, where they were surrounded by other children of all races. There were a few kids out in the rural districts mostly, that went to segregated schools. Um, Bakit Sakatani, who we'll talk about a little further on, talks about how the white children in his area went to one school and the Mexican-American and Japanese-American children went to another one. But for the most part, uh, they, they were in a very mixed culture. They didn't see a lot of discrimination themselves. That's not to say that it wasn't out there. Japanese Americans had faced discrimination almost since their arrival in the United States. But for the most part, parents had been able to shield their kids from that. But that's all going to change very dramatically on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese Navy bombs the U.S. military installation in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And as soon as that happens, the entire climate of the United States changes and changes for the worse towards Japanese Americans. Uh, suddenly these kids who were not used to uh, being identified solely by their Japanese American identity are being called names in school. Uh, they are getting blamed for the war or being told that their parents are responsible for the war. And they're even being told, a lot of kids remember that the friends came up and said that they weren't allowed to play with them anymore because they were of Japanese ancestry. And so it's a very dramatic shift and very confusing for these kids because in their minds and what their parents have always told them is that they are real Americans. And so to be suddenly singled out as potential traitors is very shocking to them and it stings them very, very deeply. And it only gets worse in the weeks to come. 
Uh, soon after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the FBI begins raiding Japanese American households, uh, showing up unannounced, going through everything. Kids got used to seeing their parents destroying family heirlooms, uh, old photographs, anything that ties them to Japan because they're afraid that the FBI is going to use this to make a case against them, that they're spies or saboteurs. And so a lot of these families' histories are destroyed or hidden away. Uh, and it becomes uh, bad to have any ties back to Japan at all. And so this is uh, very traumatizing, as you can imagine. But it doesn't end there. Shortly after that, the FBI also starts rounding up people. Uh, Bacon Sakatani was 10 years old at the time, living in El Puente, California. And his father was out uh, when the FBI agents came to the door there. And so they went through the whole household, ransacked everything, looking for evidence against Bacon's father. And before they left, they told his mother that when his father returned back home, he needed to go to the police station the very next day uh, to talk with him. And so when his father came home the next day, he did so. And then he vanished. Uh, he disappeared, never came home. Uh, they would find out later that he was taken off to Tuna Canyon, uh, a camp that had been set up for Issei men, uh, so for Japanese immigrant men outside of Los Angeles there. Because the Issei were not eligible to become American citizens because of discriminatory laws, they didn't have the protections that their kids did. And so they all became enemy aliens as soon as the U.S. entered the war. And the FBI could pick them up just on suspicion. Sometimes the suspicion that they had was just that they were a teacher in a Japanese language school. But it wasn't just Bacon. Hundreds of men along the West Coast were picked up and taken to these temporary detention centers. Uh, Bacon, for his part, didn't see his dad for several months. It was left to his mom to really run the farm in his dad's absence uh, until they could get more information about it. And as we come to the spring of 1942, things get even worse. Uh, now these families, many of them with their fathers gone, uh, suddenly start seeing a rumor that they had heard for several weeks becoming a reality. These posters that you see here start going up in Japanese American neighborhoods across the West Coast. And essentially they tell anybody of Japanese ancestry that they are supposed to go to the government office that's been set up in their neighborhood and register for their eventual removal from the West Coast. Generally, families, uh, once they have reported to these offices, had about a week to two weeks to decide what they were going to bring with them. And kids were an active part of this packing. Uh, families could take only what they could carry with them. And so they had to make some tough decisions. And the kids' possessions usually did not uh, make the list there. Uh, if you are packing the necessities to go somewhere for you don't know how long, uh, the toys and games of your children don't usually rate near the top of the list. And so a lot of kids gave up everything that was really theirs. There were a few that talk about how they were able to fit some of their comic book collection or their baseball card collection into the bottom of their suitcase. But generally, they were asked to give up everything. Uh, Norman Mineta, who was uh, 10 at this time, was allowed to bring his baseball bat and his uh, glove with him. And so he brought those with him when they had to report to the train station where they were going to leave out from. And the first thing that happened was that the military police soldier uh, there took away Norm's bat because it could be used as a deadly weapon. And so he wasn't allowed to bring it with him at all. At first, families did not immediately go to the places like Heart Mountain. First, they wound up going to much smaller camps, uh, which the government called assembly centers. And these assembly centers uh, were located on the West Coast. They were meant to be temporary until the larger camps could be built. Uh, 
And in the case of the people who would eventually wind up at Heart Mountain, most of them went to one of two places, either the Pomona Assembly Center or the Santa Anita Assembly Center. Both of these places for kids had been places that they would have associated with fun before the war. Uh, Pomona had been the Los Angeles County Fairgrounds and Santa Anita had been a horse racing track at a time when horse racing was very popular among a wide audience, mostly based on Seabiscuit, uh, the famous racehorse, and had a huge win at Santa Anita just two years before. But now when families showed up to these places, they would see that they were surrounded by barbed wire. They would see that makeshift barracks had been quickly constructed throughout them. Uh, in, case, in the fact of Santa Anita, the barracks that they had constructed weren't even enough to hold the entire population. And so they wound up mucking out the stables and actually putting families inside of these uh, old horse stalls as living uh, spaces uh, with just really a mucking out and a quick coat of whitewash. And so there was actually a running debate among the kids at Santa Anita about who was living in Seabiscuit stall. Generally, families were only here for about four to five months. Uh, around August of 1942, everybody started to learn that they would eventually be heading for Wyoming. And not long after that, they started loading into trains. About 500 people at a time would leave out uh, on each of these trains and head off. Norman Mineta, when he heard what was going to be happening there, uh, he went and got his full Boy Scout uniform on. On the train that had taken him to Santa Anita, he had been allowed, because he was wearing his Boy Scout uniform, to run messages in between the cars when people were wanting to communicate with each other. Unfortunately, he discovered pretty quickly this was not going to be the case uh, on the train to Heart Mountain, and instead he was confined to his car for pretty much the duration of the trip. The only real relief that they had on this usually four to five day trip was when they were allowed to go to the dining car sometimes uh, for their meals, or they had to go to the bathroom. Otherwise, people had to stay in their seats, and when they went through any kind of town or city or settlement, they would have to pull down the window shades all the way to make sure that nobody could see out and nobody could see in. And so for kids, you can imagine this was a very boring and restless trip. When they arrived at Heart Mountain, uh, they saw a kind of barren uh, place out in front of them. Uh, we were already up in the middle of the high desert and the government had in fact graded a lot of the topsoil off to form the residential area of the camp. So it was really just sitting on a, a big plain of dirt uh, there. And although some kids were relieved to see that they had finally reached their destination, others still had questions lurking in their mind. You know, they wondered how long are we gonna be here? Is it gonna be forever? They wondered, was there going to be school here at Heart Mountain? They wondered if they were able to leave the camp if they wanted to. And that got answered pretty quickly, that last one, because not long after they got here, the barbed wire fences and the guard towers started to go up around them there. Uh, these guard towers were always staffed by a military police soldier that was always uh, stationed up in them, uh, that was always armed as well. And so it could be a little intimidating, but Bacon, when he got here, he remembers not being scared of he said that when he saw the guard towers, uh, he knew that uh, he couldn't be a threat to anybody. He couldn't fathom the idea that anyone could see him as a danger. And so therefore the guard towers didn't bother him at all. Uh, he said the first time that he felt afraid was actually when he left the camp. Uh, someone had had the idea to take a group of kids out to the nearby city of Powell on a day trip and got permission from the administration to do so. And once Bacon arrived in Powell, he saw that there were signs in the store windows, uh, many of them using racial slurs and really angry language that barred Japanese Americans from even entering the store and let them know they were welcome. And it was the first time that it dawned on Bacon that there were people out there that hated him just because of his race. And that was the scariest thing for him. And like Bacon, that was true of other kids. A lot of them felt much safer inside of the camp itself. 
uh, although life could be very boring, uh, in the early days, at least there was a lot to explore and there were a lot of other kids around inside of the camp. Uh, but when it came down to actually living with their families inside of the camp, it became very, very difficult. As you can see in these pictures, these barracks rooms that they were living inside of were very, very sparse. And families all lived inside of a single room. And that room could be as small as 16 by 20 or as large as 24 feet by 20 depending on the size of your family. So it was a cramped living space. Uh, there was no privacy inside of it. It was noisy all the time. It was extremely hot in the summertime and extremely cold in the wintertime. And nobody spent more time in the barracks than they absolutely had to. Uh, these spaces uh, were pretty awful. And so people tried to find other things to do that kept them away from the home, which meant that it kept them away from their family. And so kids kind of started to roam around the camp on their own. There was no need to be called in back for dinner in the evening because dinner wasn't at your home. The barracks weren't set up for cooking. Instead, for your three meals a day, you would line up in front of the mess hall in your block. And the mess hall functioned kind of like a cafeteria. Kids and adults would go through this line here, get their food, and then they'd go and sit down on sort of these long picnic tables that are front here and it was interesting to see what happened just within the first couple of weeks because pretty soon the adults would all go sit on one side of the building and the kids would all go sit on the other side of the building and so family dinners of the past that these children have been used to were pretty well gone uh, Shig Yabu talks about how he was the only kid in all of Block 14 in his mess hall that had to eat with the adults. And in fact, his parents sometimes made him carry his tray back to the barracks so they could have a private family dinner. And he remembered how much he hated it at the time. But he now credits it, uh, now that he's older, with having saved his family during this period, having kept them close and kept them from drifting apart like other families did. Because of this breakdown of the family unit inside of the camp, there started to be a real problem with gangs. Uh, these were older boys, teenagers, uh, that had sort of formed together and really didn't have anybody watching over them. You know, they were able to sort of run freely because they didn't have to answer their parents. They didn't have to go home in the evenings. And so you have these gangs that mostly fought with one another, bullied younger kids, but also would uh, steal things from around the camp, would vandalize as well. And the adults pretty quickly figured out that they were going to have to do something to resolve this situation. And so the recreation department was created and a number of clubs were formed. Uh, you're seeing the sewing club right uh, here, but there were clubs for almost any interest. Uh, there were swing dance clubs, there were art clubs, uh, there were uh, weightlifting clubs, and there were also just social clubs. And these clubs would arrange dances around the camp, uh, usually around holidays, and they would raise money for the war effort. And it gave kids, more than anything, a real sense of purpose. It allowed them to feel like they were doing something to help. And within a year of the creation of this program, uh, the gang problem, the juvenile delinquency problem that happened at Heart Mountain was almost non-existent. Scouting was probably one of the most popular activities the kids took part in. Uh, we had Boy Scout troops, we had Girl Scout troops, we had even a troop of campfire girls within the camp. Uh, you're seeing one of the Girl Scout troops here. They did, in fact, sell cookies inside of Heart Mountain, if you can believe that, for 75 cents a box, uh, but only for the first year. After that, uh, sugar rationing kicked in in a big way, and they had to switch over to selling war savings stamps for the rest of the time in the camp. One of the things that every scout group looked forward to was the trip to Yellowstone that happened every year. Uh, the first year of the camp's existence, the administrators had made a deal with park officials over at Yellowstone to make the group camp there available to uh, the incarcerated kids so that they could leave camp and see a little bit of nature. And so 
it was a big incentive for a lot of kids to join scouts just so they could go on this trip right here. Um, troop 333, one of the Boy Scout troops in the camp, actually spent one summer uh, their time at Yellowstone building a bridge across the Nez Perce Creek. And they were delighted to find when they had their reunion uh, here in Wyoming in 2002 that that bridge was actually still standing out there. Uh, this isn't Troop 333 that you're seeing on the screen, by the way, um, but it is Bacon Sakatani's troop, and he is right front and center there in the uh, light colored jacket that you see. Normanetta, uh, as we had mentioned earlier, was also heavily involved in scouts in, back in California. and stayed involved in scouts when he was here at Hard Mountain. And it actually led to him forming one of the longest friendships of his life. Uh, the scoutmaster in Hart Mountain that uh, was Norm's troop leader and then uh, the troop leader in Cody, Glenn Livingston, had an idea to bring the Cody Scouts and the Hart Mountain Scouts together as a show of solidarity of scouting, you know, even during wartime. And so Glenn Livingston brought his troop of scouts out to Hard Mountain uh, with some trepidation uh, to meet with the boys out here. And Norm was actually partnered up with a uh, Cody scout by the name of Al Simpson. And over the next couple of days uh, and subsequent trips to Hard Mountain, Al and Norm grew very, very close and uh, became fast friends. That friendship faded a little bit after Norm moved back to California. They lost touch, but eventually they reunited uh, when Norm became a Democratic congressman for California and Al was serving as a Republican senator for the state of Wyoming. And so they uh, met once again and rekindled their friendship. They're still fast friends to this day and still see each other at least once a year at the Hearth Home. In addition to scouts, we also had a number of sports the kids could take part in around the camp. Baseball was far and away the most popular, but there was also basketball, there was football, there was tennis. Uh, there were all varieties of sports that uh, kids could be active in. In addition to that, in the summertime, uh, there was swimming here within the camp. What you're looking at in this picture is the Hard Mountain Swimming Pool, which swimming pool is a very generous word for it. Uh, this was a gravel line pit that was fed by water from the irrigation ditch. Uh, but it did provide some relief against the heat in the summertime, gave kids something to do there. Uh, kids would also swim in the irrigation ditch and canals themselves. And that actually had to be stopped um, not long after the camp was open because a 10 year old boy got swept up in the current of the canal and, and drowned. And so after that, the administration really cracked down on swimming in the canals and uh, really limited them to just this pool here. The winter time, uh, there was ice skating. The recreation department actually froze over uh, uh, a whole field uh, out in the middle, middle of camp and then various smaller fields uh, at different places around the camp. And the kids were able to go ice skating there. For California kids, this was an absolute novelty. Um, many people remember to this day how much they fell down as they were learning to skate right there. Uh, but it became a very popular pastime. When the weather wasn't good enough to skate, when uh, the uh, blizzards were blowing around here when the wind picked up and it made it uncomfortable to be outside. Uh, kids could be found inside. One big fad that uh, happened at Hart Mountain was that Ouija boards became hugely popular. And so a lot of times on bad days in the wintertime, you could find the kids holed up in somebody's barrack trying to commune with the spirits. Uh, the other thing, of course, that they did was to read. Um, Shigabu talks about how he brought uh, one book with him to camp, Huckleberry Finn, and how he read it probably hundreds of times during his time there. Uh, eventually, more books would become available, though. Uh, people would send them in from the outside, and they were able to establish sort of a camp library to where they would have other books to read. <laughs> 
Amongst the older kids, dancing was probably one of the most popular things uh, with the teenagers there. Uh, we had quite a bit, uh, quite a few avid swing dancers within the camp. Uh, actually, from the urban kids in LA, you had quite a bit of zoot suiters um, who had picked up that trend from their Mexican-American friends and uh, could be seen, if they could get a hold of it, wearing their zoot suit finery at these dances. Um, there's a story about uh, some teenagers stealing uh, chains that held the drain plugs and the laundry sinks and using them as watch chains on their zoot suits even. Uh, the band that played for these dances, the Georgia Gawa Orchestra, started out as a band of professional musicians but uh, eventually attracted a number of teenagers as well. And as the older men were eventually allowed to go and seek jobs in the Midwest and leave the camp, their teenage understudies started to fill in the ranks of it, and pretty soon it was a very young band that they had in Heart Mountain as well. School started up in the fall of 1942, um, not long after the Japanese Americans arrived here, and it was a welcome change for most kids, even though the school conditions were extremely rough in the early days of the camp. Uh, they did not build school buildings, and so essentially they just take a set of barracks, uh, usually about six of them in a row, and they would turn those into school buildings. And so the classrooms were cramped, they were noisy, they had all the other problems of the barracks that I talked about before. Uh, and also, they really didn't have desks at first, they just had hard wooden benches that had been built really quickly. There weren't textbooks available to them within the camp uh, at first, and so they got sent in as many as they could, but for the first year or so of school, most kids had to share textbooks, you know, they'd just have a few between each class there. Uh, but uh, schooling gradually got better as it went on. Eventually, the incarcerees and the administration got together to complete plans for a much nicer high school inside of the camp and uh, it was built before the 1943 school year. It was a great building, um, had modern classrooms, it had a huge gymnasium, it had a dark room, it had a library. It was actually an environment that was good for learning. And they planned to build an elementary school right next door uh, to get those kids out of the barracks as well. But as soon as they had just started planning out that project. There was a huge uproar from the politicians in Wyoming. All during this time, they'd been accusing the federal government of pampering the Japanese Americans in the camps, of not treating them the way that they thought they should be treated. They thought that they should not only be sent away from their homes, but actually actively punished while they were here. And so there was this huge outcry about having a nice school for these kids to go to. And so eventually the political pressure was such that the federal government told the administrators of Heart Mountain to scrap their plans for the elementary school and it never got built. The elementary schools, the kids had to continue going to school inside of the barracks there. In early 1945, Japanese Americans were told that they could return home. Uh, they were told that it was no longer a military necessity for them to stay in the camps, but what had really happened was that the Supreme Court uh, had finally heard some of the test cases that were coming through, and they had said that there was no way that the military could hold them here indefinitely without charging them. And so eventually, the Japanese Americans were allowed to go back home. But it didn't happen right away. The government had hoped to close the camp in February of 1945, but it actually remained open until November of 1945. The reason behind that is that most people had nowhere to go back to. And so the folks that left early in the year were largely, again, the fathers and the husbands who went back to try and find work back on the West Coast to try and establish themselves so they they could then send for their families. Didn't make any sense to move the whole family out there when you didn't know how you were going to make money. And so the camp once again became a camp that was primarily women, children, and the elderly there. And even after the camp started to close down and people started to head back home, uh, really life was very different than it had been before the war. Um, 
kids faced a lot of anxiety about what they were going back to, how it was going to be, where they still going to be hated back on the West Coast, where they going to have their houses back, uh, where their parents going to be able to get their businesses and farms back. And in a lot of cases, they didn't. Um, Bacon talks about how his family for a little while had to live in an army tent in their landlord's backyard. Uh, Shig jokes about how he was the only kid who was uh, living in a mansion after the war was over. And that's not a good thing because it meant that his parents who had owned their own business prior to the war were now serving as a butler and a maid to this rich family uh, in San Francisco. And so there were many, many years before things would go back to normal. And I think that's why it's important that we look at kids. I think that our inclination is to believe or to want to tell ourselves that uh, kids are resilient, um, that these things don't affect them in the same way. But when you talk to the people who survived Heart Mountain, uh, who lived through it as children, you start to see that they had the same problems as the adults. They had the same fears about what was going to happen to them. Uh, they had the same confusion about why all of this was happening. And they really struggled through a lot of the very same issues that, you know, I think people hoped that they wouldn't understand. They understood quite keenly. And so while they shared in some of the joys they were able to create at Heart Mountain, they also experienced a lot of the pain of the incarceration, more than we sometimes register. If you're interested in learning more about the story of children at Heart Mountain and interested in sharing it with the young people in your life, I'd like to recommend to you two books that you can follow up with for further information. The first for our younger readers is Hello Maggie. And then for those who have graduated to chapter books, we have Boy of Heart Mountain. Both of these stories are based on the life of Shig Yabu, who we mentioned several times throughout today's program and who actually grew up to become a board member of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. Both of these are a great introduction to this history for any students that are looking to learn more about it. I wanna thank you for joining us today and for helping us to kick off this new initiative. I look forward to seeing a lot more of you in the next several weeks. Thanks for joining us.